everybody. I'm really excited to be with you today. I have a message that I call, I'm taking it from my course in personal evangelism. And it, out of that course, I am focusing on our personal witness. And I believe that you will be blessed by this. I'm checking the sound to make sure I'm strong. We're strong. We're good. Excellent. We made a nice transition. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, so we're glad that you are here with us. So personal witnessing and its power as a way of life for every believer. As I get into that and start with that, I want to start with these few scriptures. You know, the outcome for the soul winner or the individual who is involved in leading people to Christ, the outcome for the soul winner is given to us in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. The scripture says, the fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life, and he, and I would add, of course, or she who wins souls is wise. Proverbs 11 and verse 30. He or she who wins souls is wise. So ultimately, the outcome of us learning to become better witnesses for Jesus Christ is truly, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, we do become wise. It is very warm in here, gentlemen, that we become wise. Proverbs 20 verse and verse 24 and verse 4 says this, through knowledge, a house is built, understanding it is established, wisdom fills it with Pre pleasant and precious riches. So I am telling you today, as a per personal witness for Jesus Christ, you have a guarantee of wisdom. And the guarantee of wisdom is that the ministry, the outreach that you will build will be filled with pleasant and precious riches. And that's my confession and that is my proclamation over you here today. So as we begin, I just want to open with a brief word of prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for all those who are listening and the thousands that will listen after this point in time when this is rebroadcast. I thank you, Lord, that you are touching the hearts of individuals who are listening today and that they are open to hear what you have to say. Lord, may my heart, may my words reflect what you have for the people today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, the outcome for the soul winner, he or she that wins souls is wise. Proverbs 11 and verse 30. As we begin this message, though, to set the parameters for understanding personal soul winning, I really want to lay out some important scriptures for you. Because when we look into the Gospels, we know, we have knowledge that the end of all four Gospels is the beginning of our ministry. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 19 say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The end of Mark. See, these four endings set for us a precedent that is very significantly important to us because the Gospels were the introduction of the new way, an example of what could be done in life through any person who would believe on Jesus Christ. When we go past the Gospels and we look into the epistles, we are looking at the picture of the church. We are learning how to live as Christians. But if we try truly want to understand how to outreach, how to go out among the lost, Jesus gives us a picture of the love, the power, the wisdom, and the tools that we have available to bring knowledge of the gospel today. And he finished his advent here on this earth by saying, <laughs> giving us a commission in the end of all four gospels. Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 19. Mark Chapter 16, verses 15 to through 20. And he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And verse 20 tells us, and they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. In Luke chapter 46, he told them this. Verse, uh, uh, excuse me, in Luke 
he told them this, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, it's 24, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you to what my father has promised. And then he says, stay in the city until you be clothed with power from on high. The end of the four gospels are our beginning. John 20 and verse 21 says, Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. The book of Acts also gives us a picture of where our story begins. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. In my first book, O Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. In other words, I wrote of all that Jesus began to do and teach. You and I are the continuators of what Jesus began to do and to teach. So when we look into the arena of personal soul winning, first we want to recognize that you are the mouthpiece of God in today's society. Romans 10 verses 14 through 15 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written. Now listen. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Listen, the gospel is good news. The gospel is glad tidings for those who hear it. The gospel brings us into connection with the living God. Now, I'm just setting the parameters and the framework before I get into the practical aspect of soul winning. One, we learn this. We may have confidence, according to the Gospels, that our audience is listening to us. And not only are they listening. And what do I mean our audience? I mean our audience may be an audience of one. The one that you may be involved in leading to the Lord. The one in whom you may have relationship with to share this good news. Now, I know in some nations of the world, we're not allowed to openly street witness. We are not allowed to openly make proclamation of the gospel. But still, we have relationships and we have opportunity to connect with people and to communicate good news. In Acts 28 and verse 28, it says this, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. What's so interesting about this story is here is Cornelius, a man who is a great leader among the Roman Empire, yet Cornelius was outside of what the people understood to be the, should we say the church of the day? The chosen of the day, the selected of the day. But here was Cornelius, and the scripture says in Acts 28 that he was a man who was known for his good works, his giving of alms, and his prayer. And so as he was praying and seeking God, he had a divine visitation. And that visitation let him know that he was to call for the man Peter, and Peter would bring witness of this uh, and, and tell him what he needed to know. Oh, my, we've got a feedback here. Okay, praise the Lord. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) So, be it known, therefore, unto you that salvation of God has come to you. Let me read this scripture, because I like what some of these pieces of the scripture tell us. Uh, It's good news. When Peter began to speak, he said these words, In Acts 28 and verse 34, I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism, but welcomes those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. He has sent this message to the people of Israel, proclaiming the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Now he says, I understand that God does not show favoritism. Listen, our message is a message for every culture, every nation, every people, every group. And our message does not show favoritism. In other words, someone might say, well, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a Muslim, or I'm um, Orthodox, or I'm... um, 
I'm a biker. <laughs> or I'm from this particular heavy metal rock group. Whatever they might say to us, the gospel does not show favoritism. Because as Peter was in the midst of the vision that he was having from heaven and the encounter he was having with God, he was told that he should take and that he should eat from the sheet that was being lowered from heaven. In his mind, that was anathema. In his mind, he should never do that. Why? Because to do that in terms of the law was considered to be unclean. Folks, I want you to know that when we share our personal witness and we get out there among the lost, there are times that we will sense that we are in the midst of the unclean environment. I had opportunity this past week to minister up at the um, White Eagle at a biker rally. Oh, my goodness. We had bikers <coughs> that were coming from all over the world who were there. Well, I must tell you, they didn't use the same language that we use. They don't dress the way we dress. And they certainly, in some of their performances, did not honor God in the way that we would honor God. Yet, among that group, because of their commitment, because of their knowledge of tribe, because of their knowledge of commitment, because of their knowledge of respecting and honoring the people they are associated with within their tribe, they were very open. We would meet individuals, and as we would share the gospel, they were very open. Was it an uncomfortable environment? I tell people this. Hey, I was a missionary to the bikers. It's not my culture, but they certainly are a people who want to know God and who love God. So remember that God shows no favoritism to any one person, but all people have free and willing access to hear this good news. That's how we set the agenda for our personal witness and personal testimony. What else must we know in order to be prepared as a personal witness? One, we must recognize we go in power and we go in boldness. We have a message we like to preach, which we call miracles, moxie, and money. It takes miracles, it takes money, and it takes moxie. So let's look at power, which we call moxie. What is moxie? Moxie, <coughs> some say it's the elan, the step in your in your, the way that you walk. It is the determination to complete something. It is focused on doing something with boldness. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7 through 8, it says this. As you go preach, saying, now listen, we go in power. As you go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. I encourage you to get my series on, it's called Healing Agents, because there I go through this passage with great detail. Why? Most people spend most of their time asking God to heal the people when they lay hands on them or pray for them. But in reality, the people were healed 2,000 years ago. So you and I now have authority as believers as disciples, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John, we have power to go. And we are told to not pray for the sick. We're told to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out devils. Surely this is the empowerment that we have as Christians. I like what verse 9 of Matthew chapter 10 says. It says, do not carry any gold or silver or copper in your belts. No bag for the road or a second tunic or sandals or staff for the worker is worthy of his provisions. Do you hear me? Miracles. Everyone under the sound of my voice recognize that the worker is worthy of his provisions and we call those in for everyone associated with this ministry and everyone who is involved at any level with the opportunity to do some type of evangelism. The worker is worthy of his provisions. In 2 Timothy verse 1 and 7, it says this, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. John 14 and verse 12 says this, verily, verily, I say unto you that he who believes on me, are you hearing me? He who believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Greater works. 
our gospel is a gospel of power. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Listen, I am giving you a full realm of scriptures that will solidify the foundation for your soul winning ministry. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Because I remember this. The first time Kevin would take large teams out to witness of the gospel in Detroit, Michigan. And one day, no one showed up for him to take out street witnessing. And when that happened, Kevin, (laughs) he said to the Lord, I usually have 17 to 27, 25 people that show up each week to help me witness of the gospel. And they didn't show up. So Kevin prayed and he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, are you changing my ministry? What's happening? What are you doing? And, and as Kevin was praying and speaking to the Lord in this way, the Lord gave him a little mini vision. And he saw himself in downtown Troy, Detroit, standing in front of the Mariner Church, standing on this little rock wall that had a statue there at the end. And he was preaching in the mini vision. Well, his next thought was, well, I guess I have to obey <laughs> what I saw. So he went downtown, he got onto that rock, and he began to preach. And as he began to speak, he got a crowd. But the crowd said to him, a man out of the crowd said, Who gives you the authority to speak to us this way? (laughs) Kevin thought, Who gives me the authority? Who gives me the authority? And then all of a sudden he thought, Mark, Mark gives me the authority. He told me to go into all of the world and preach the good news, the gospel. And when he said that, the crowd responded because the crowd, when the one man asked, who gives you the authority? The rest of the crowd asked, who gives you the authority to speak to us? And when Kevin said, Mark gives me the authority, the crowd responded by saying, okay, And they let him preach on. Why is this important to you and I? You must know your foundation. You must know the authority that you go in and the power that you go in as well. Remember this. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who that who believes. To the Jew first, in other words, to the nuclear that's closest to you, but also to the Greek, to everyone at the farthest point from you. So, some might call this power evangelism. Some might call this miracle evangelism in our witness and in our testimony. But as I make this transition, I want to say this to you because it is vital in understanding gospel ministry. Many years ago, when Kevin and I began doing our first mass outreaches with Dr. T.L. Osborne, I came from a school, which I honor greatly, that taught me the importance of power and authority, as I am teaching you today. And I would, after our first nights in the miracle evangelism, I would say to Dr. T.L., Dr. T.L., I understand we have power. Did you see the power of God in action last night? Isn't it amazing what God's doing? And look, we have authority to change this city and this nation. Dr. T.L. would always rephrase my conversation. And by doing that, he would say, Leslie, isn't it amazing how much God loves the people? Isn't it amazing what the love of God did last night in healing the people, in saving the people, and in delivering the people? See, I remember standing in Gabon when a hunchback who was bent over like this, and he could not stand up. He came up on the platform to testify. How do I know this story? His pastor brought him. And his pastor was standing on the platform and he was, he was in shock. He was weeping, but he was in shock and he was rubbing his hand down the back the man's back. And he said, this man could not stand up straight before. Do I rejoice in the power of God? That man had been that way for over 40 years. Do I rejoice in the power of God? No. I rejoice in knowing how much God loved that man, that he gave his son Jesus, that he could encounter him not just as Savior, but as deliverer and healer. So it is the message of love that we bring. 
you know, we were in the city of uh, Kiev in the Ukraine, and we were there with a couple of leaders. One in particular had the largest church at that time in the Ukraine. And he asked Dr. T.L. Osborne, and I have preached this all over the world. He asked Dr. T.L. Osborne, what do you credit the success in your ministry to? And I remember Dr. T.L. sitting there thinking, you know, he's rubbing his goatee, and he was just thinking and thinking because it was 60 years of ministry what do you credit the success of 60 years of ministry in your life to after he thought about it for a few minutes he said these two things first he said love god and then secondly love people you know if we recognize the scripture tells us that we are to mark chapter 12 and verse 30 love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength and that the second is this that you would love your neighbor as yourself you see many a preacher has come forth with the fist or the anger or the fire that i must do something to you but in reality jesus said that the greatest of all the commandments is that we would first love the lord our god and in loving our god his love becomes a part and a reality in our being of who we are and then as we love the lord our god do you know what happens our motivations change you know sometimes we come under pressure in life as an evangelist, as a preacher, as a worker, as a harvester, as a mother, as a father, as a young person, the pressures of life can try to crush out the fires of the good news and the gospel. And it's at those moments in life we must learn, we must exercise our right to freely love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. I've heard it said many times, you tell me you have great faith or great power or great authority, you know, and I'm so impressed, oh, at the, at the miracles and the power and the authority. You know, that doesn't impress me. What impresses me is how much God loves each one of us and how much he loves every individual who is yet to discover that he is a lover he is a healer he is a lover of our souls and my the russian contingency over there that's listening today they would say this they would say leslie's favorite song is jesus lover of my soul he truly is the lover of our souls let's allow our souls to be transformed so that we may love our neighbor as ourselves when we talk about this revelation or this understanding regarding love we cannot forget that at the cross that's where we find the message <coughs> of love john three sixteen says for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life in first john we discover that there is no greater love than this we understand that it's not that we loved god first but that he first loved us us god's motivation towards us is not power god's motivation towards us is not authority but god's motivation and jesus's willingness to go to the cross and god's willingness to give his very own son is the motivation of love so my prayer for you today as you listen is that you would be passionately motivated by the love of god to communicate the good news to those who do not yet know it so we recognize that at the cross people encounter the love of god it is in the resurrection that we count encounter the power of god but uh, folks i want to submit to you today and ask you the question what came first the love came first the cross was followed by the resurrection. So I encourage you today that although we preach a gospel of power, we understand that that power truly is given to us through the motivation of his love to see the lost one for Christ. We were ministering to a crowd of about 250,000 in the nation of, um, I believe it was Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire, depending on which country you're from and uh, we were driving across the edge of that crowd you know 250,000 people that's fairly large <laughs> and so I saw this old man laying on a mat 
And as I looked, at, when I looked out that car window and that man was laying there, it, it was as if my heart leapt out of the car. And so I told my driver and I said, stop the car. And my interpreter, stop the car. I'm going to get out. Well, <laughs> they said, Mama Leslie, you can't do that. You can't get out. And I said, stop the car. I'm going to get out. They wouldn't stop. So finally, I opened my car door. And when I started to get out, when the car was moving, they finally stopped the car. And I went over to the old man who was there laying on the mat. And I said to him, sir, and he was nothing but skin and bones. I said, sir, you don't know me, but I want you to know that as I looked out of that car window at you just now, this great love of God came forth for you. And I want you to know that tonight is your night. He is your healer, that, that Jesus will touch you, transform you. And I believe right now you are healed by the power of God. He looked at me and he said, yes. And he started to get up. And I said to the man, sir, we will have testimonies at the end of the meeting because right now I don't need a stampede. I didn't tell him that. <laughs> but the reality was I didn't need a stampede from a crowd of a quarter of a million people. But I told him, I want you to be the first up on the platform tonight. So I spoke that evening and when I, before we even began finishing the prayer, I looked to my side and there was the man who was nothing but pure skin and bones and he was carrying his staff and he had on a coat of many colors wrapped around his white garments and he was walking across that platform with great strength declaring that Jesus was his Lord and Jesus had healed him. What came first, folks? At the cross, we meet the Savior. At the cross, we meet the healer. At the cross, we find his love. And now you and I, who already know him, we encounter his power and his boldness so that we can deliver the message of the cross to his people. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I am getting motivated by what I am remembering. Remember this, that as the ultimate purpose is to be a witness of his love, let's ask the Lord to break our hearts for his people. Imagine if you had five children and, and tomorrow you woke up and two of them you could never find again. Two of them you would never see again. Two of them had been removed from your household to never be seen again. How would you react? Your heart would be broken. Your plea, your cry, your search, your efforts to find those two children. Folks, that's how God looks at the lost. That's how our heavenly Father looks at those who are without. Let's ask Him to give us a heart that will strengthen us so that we may lead the 99 sheep and we may go after the one that is lost. Remember this, that the great commission, in English this sounds good, is not the great suggestion. <laughs> But it is a commandment. It is a commission to be completed. Soul winning is not a program, but soul winning is a passion. Soul winning is not an event, but soul winning is a lifestyle. And souls are the currency of eternity. And as I heard Dr. T.L. Osborne tell me many years ago, because I wanted to know what was a missionary, you know, I was proud. I left everything to move to Russia to be a missionary. I had been in so many nations. I was proud. And do you know what he said to me? After a long time, he finally answered, and he said these words. He said, a missionary is when every person is, making, is witnessing of Christ. Folks. We're all missionaries. Every one of us is called to be a missionary. Some of us will never leave our neighborhood, our workplace, our church uh, family that does the events together. Others of us are called to be separated and to go out and to be those ministers of good news. But in all of that, let's allow him to work in our hearts with his love and with his passion. Well, I hope you're getting something out of this today. The result, let's remember this, that the result of Pentecost after the resurrection, the result of Pentecost was what? Power. Here again, we're encountering this word power. How do we, as Christians, walk in the power? We walk in the power recognizing his love, never forgetting the importance of his love. So 
the result of Pentecost. The result is power. Acts 2 and verse 21 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, why do I share this? Because Jesus told them to wait until they be endued with power from on high. So if you're listening to me today and you haven't had that Holy Ghost encounter with that endowment from power on high, then today is your day. We'll pray, and I believe that will happen to you. But in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost had come upon the people, after the 120 had made witness of Christ, the end of the chapter, the sermon that is given by Peter on that day is this, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in other words, the outcome, the result of the power, the ultimate end goal of the game plan to be endued with power from on high is to be witness, witnesses for Christ so that whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. I don't know about you, but that gets me excited because those 120 on that one day, there were 3,000 that were added to the church because they put themselves in position to have the passion of Christ, to walk in the boldness, and to have experienced his love and then take that good news to the lost. Praise the Lord. So now that our hearts are positioned and we understand we are ready to be his authorized communicators of good news. Let's talk about some practicalities of the good news of being witnesses in this world. We have just, uh, my clock says I have 24 minutes and 45 seconds left with you. I think I should have taken both hours and we may change our format in the future where one of us does the whole time. But anyway, personal witnessing as the way of life for every believer. Let's start with some practical thoughts. One, I want you to remember this. Look for opportunities to witness. We, we've looked at the four Gospels, but I, I want to encourage you today. It is important that you look for opportunities to witness. If we are hurried and busy about life, we may forget the person standing in line at the grocery store. Or we may forget the person who's depressed today in the office or the person who at the lunch table today seemed down. And if we're not looking for the opportunities, if we're not alert of mind and of heart, we can miss the soul winning opportunities coming to us. I remember one day I got on an airplane. I was flying uh, across the United States and I was really excited because we'd had a couple of real great financial miracles for the ministry and and my decision was <laughs> because of these great financial miracles I was gonna go out and win somebody to the Lord for Jesus well I tell you what God did not fail me when I got on the airplane they came up to me I always would sit at the bulkhead and ask me to move my seat because they needed to put another gentleman on the aisle he couldn't sit on the inside because he was claustrophobic and I thought okay Lord this is my opportunity to witness and so when they brought the man on the plane, and you know, for me, it's uncomfortable because that meant I had to get in this co corner where I didn't have a lot of leg room. But I thought, I said, I'm looking for an opportunity to witness. I believe this is it. So the gentleman sat down beside me. And when he did, this thought came to me, Cornelius. So after we took up and we got in the air, because he would hardly look at me, I said, sir, I said, I perceive that you are a good man, that you love your family and that you care greatly about your family. And I just want you to know that I don't believe that the Lord or God wants you to suffer with this fear. And I said, and I believe he sat you beside me today on this airplane because he wants you to know that you can be free. He looked at me and he said, oh, he said, I can't do anything. He said, once I got underneath the house to try to fix something, and since that moment, I have dealt with fear and claustrophobia. He said, and, and fear to get in any kind of closed space. And I said, sir, today you can meet the living God, and he will deliver you from that fear. So right there on the airplane, he invited Jesus to come into his heart and he received him as his Lord. Look for ways to witness. Look for, look for 
opportunity. You know, the Lord gave me that word of knowledge that I perceive you're like Cornelius. Because I'll tell you frankly, many times when I go to witness somebody, to somebody, <laughs> many times they'll say, ah, there's no hope for me. God's given up on me. Like during bike week, some of them I would talk to them and they'd say, ah, I'm already burning. There's no hope for me. <laughs> I remember one of them, I said, sir, <laughs> he was tall like I am. Big man. Like you, my dear friends in Russia and the Ukraine. A big man with a booming voice. And I just looked at him and I said, said, sir, better you find him now because the burning that's now is nothing in compared to the burning that's coming later. And I smiled and I tapped him on the shoulder. <laughs> Look for every opportunity. See, I put the fear of judgment in his heart, yet I did not condemn him. And I kept a, a happy, upbeat spirit about that whole thing now as we've talked earlier remember we look for opportunities to witness we look for boldness to take the opportunities that he gives us and then remember this as a witness for christ paul was a witness but it says this of paul in acts 22 and verse 15 he was told that he would be a witness of all that he has seen and all that he has heard if this is the first time you're listening to me on this subject i want you to know that i often say this to people what is the most effective way for you to give your for you to give your witness it is simply this remember the fresh feeling of a new convert you see, Paul had been blinded because of his persecution against the Christians. So I'm thinking in his darkness, in his blindness, <laughs> in that experience, when he came back to the light and he heard these new words that were being proclaimed over him, and he understood as he was in the light that this was the proclamation spoken over his life. You will be a witness of all you have seen and heard. The greatest power that you have as a personal witness for Jesus Christ is your personal story. And when you remember that fresh feeling of that story and you share that with someone, they connect sometimes with your pain, sometimes with your victory, sometimes with your love, sometimes with your joy. Sometimes they just connect with the positive energy and the passion that you are communicating. But most often, people will not reject your personal story. In one of our upcoming sessions, I'm going to give you keys and we are going to actually learn how to write out our story so each one of us can create our own personal soul winning track. Now we look for opportunities to witness, but we also want to develop a witnessing, we call it a witnessing way of life. Now, how can we do that? One of the tools that I recommend to you and so powerful is that you learn to use prayer as a witnessing tool. You know, most people will say, well, pray for the people that you're going to come in contact with. Yes, you may ask the Lord to give you for the heathen for your inheritance, as we know it states in the book of Psalms. We ask the Lord to give us souls. We can write down their names and we can pray over them. But in our witnessing or our lifestyle of evangelism we can learn to use prayer as a witnessing tool remember to pray for people that you come in contact with i was just at that biker rally the other day and here here's the biker blessing bible a fantastic bible and i want you to know that we are being given the opportunity to create a festival bible and it will have tent nation on it it will have some of our stories and this we will use with our festivals and we have it in multiple languages so the lord is opening doors so that we can communicate this good news but as i think about this biker week and i truly went up there to be a part so that i could practice and i could hone if you will my soul winning skills well I was standing there in the tent and all of a sudden this lady comes walking across and she saw the words biker blessing on our side and she said to me, uh, I've been praying to St. Anthony <laughs> and I looked, she said, because my purse was stolen and I've lost everything. I'm from Canada and I don't have a passport. And I remember I looked at her and I said, um, 
I said, let's pray to Jesus. Jesus answers prayer. She looked at me. I grabbed her hand and we began to pray. And I said, Lord, I thank you. We call back that purse. I call back its contents. I thank you, Father. You see the predicament that she's in. And I thank you that this is a witness and a testimony that you are a loving God. Well, do you know, 24 hours later, our office received a phone call that this wonderful young lady who had no money, no ID, no credit cards, no cash, no purse, no passport, no medical card, nothing. That someone had found her purse and everything was intact and they had returned it to her with everything. Praise the Lord. At that moment, prayer was the door opener for her connection with the living God. Never forget the power of prayer as a tool. Number two, remember this as you develop your witnessing way of life. Pay attention. And I've ca- covered this already, but pay attention. You know, at this same biker seminar, or b- not seminar, biker outreach, as I was standing there on the field, it was already the end of the day. We had packed all of the suitcases. We had chain-locked, padlocked, tied everything up in the tent, and we were going home. <laughs> and as I walked to the end of the field, to me, it felt like a football field. And I looked far on the other end. There were two people sitting there were, I could only see two black t-shirts with big white logos on the back. And it was as if someone had tethered me to those individuals, tied me directly to them. And I'm standing there, Lord, everything's padlocked. It's hard to get to, but I know I need to witness to these individuals. So I went over to the car and I started digging and I found more Bibles. And then I I found actually about a stack of 10 or 15 and I carried them over there because there were many people over there. I walked around the end. I began, I walked up to the first group. Hey, you want a Bible? No, we don't want a Bible. They said, we've already got four Bibles. They've been giving us two of them all over Daytona. And I said, okay, fine. Walked around the corner of the next group of people. I said, here, I'd like to give you some Bibles. A couple of people took them. And then I targeted that group because when I got very close to them, I recognized just how hard on the exterior they really looked. And so I walked up into the middle of their their group and I said, hi, hey, we've got this beautiful biker Bible that we want to share with you today. And They just grunted, except the lady sitting at the table. She said, I'll take one. The lady at the table, the wife of the man, they both had on the white T-shirts. Both, they grabbed a Bible. And then I looked at that rough crowd and I said, hey, I want you to know it won't bite. The Bible will help you. It won't bite you. And they just, "Mm." and I said, these stories, look at this. I said, do you see that banner over there? We were with that group called Tribe of Judah. We're here praying for your safety and your protection. This Bible is full of wonderful testimonies. They all smiled and finally kind of smirked, not smiled. And they all took a Bible. Listen, it's important what tools that you use in, in part of your witnessing. And we will talk about that. But the Bible is one of those soul-winning tools. Get yourself some New Testaments and keep them with you. If you're doing 10 outreaches, always have those New Testaments available. Always have the Bible available to give to the lost. After I rebelled from God, I walked away from the Lord. When I went home after my first year of college and I went into my bedroom and I walked through the door and I fell over my bed and when my hand went all the way out. It landed on the Bible that my father had brought home from the hotel. Because at that time in America, every hotel had Bibles. And it had a pretty sun on it, like a sunset or a sunrise. And I picked it up. And when I did, I opened it up. And it opened to John chapter one in the beginning but as i got you know was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and as i opened that bible light filled the room just like on the cover of that bible and i stood there transfixed as i read john chapter one and i was instantly healed The confusion in my mind instantly left me and instantly I was reconnected with the love of God, the loving God. It was so strong that when I walked out of my bedroom, my parents reacted to what was on me and asked me, what happened to you? And I told them I had encountered Jesus. I had encountered the healer. My life had been transformed. I went back to the university campus that year and when I did, 
People would come from across the campus because they'd say, I didn't know how dark I was. They'd say, there's light. You, you, I can see the light shining out of you from across the campus. And they would say, you're going to be a preacher someday. And I would say, no, I'm not. <laughs> Never forget the importance of using a Bible as a soul winning tool. Again, I understand laws of different lands have ways in which you can do that properly. In this country, we can freely pass them out. Other countries, you need to study your laws as you do that. So pay attention. Have the soul winning tools that you need to get the job done. I've got just a few minutes listen left here. Oh. Huh. Develop your witness routine. Never forget to develop your witness routine. In other words, make special soul winning trips or take breaks out of your day just to get people saved. Smith Wigglesworth did that. He had the custom of not laying his head on his pillow until he had won a soul to the Lord every day. So make it a product of your regular routine in your day. If every day is a bit too much right now, try one a month. If one a month is a bit, you know, well, one a week. If one a week is too much, try one a month. Because he who wins souls is wise. And remember this, set some frameworks. People are busy in today's society. So tell the individuals you only have 15 minutes and you're looking for someone special to talk to right now. Hey, many people are going to respond and say, well, of course I'm someone special. What do you, I, uh, you know, when you say, listen, I don't have very much time, but I have something very special I want to share with you right now. And all of a sudden they understand you consider me special enough that you want to take time out of your valuable schedule to share with me. It's an attitude. It's a posture that what you have to share is valuable and it is important to God. And so when we walk with that confidence, we walk with that attitude, not a condescending attitude, not a I am better than thou or you attitude, but with a confidence that what we have is the very precious, most precious gift that we can give to someone. Make those special soul winning trips and take the breaks out of your day. Why? The scripture tells us that out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water, that we have the wellspring of salvation in another location that is springing up on the inside of us. Every time you witness of Jesus Christ, you give the Holy Ghost the opportunity to let that river flow, to cause that fountain to spring up into everlasting life and does Water, what does water do for an individual? Water is refreshing to us when we drink it much so more is it refreshing to our spiritual lifestyle as well. People say, oh, my life is so difficult. Things are so hard. When we were in China many years ago, Kevin and I learned this about personal soul winning. We were, huh, I think we were, we were in the city of Xi'an. We had no money. Huh. We had given our last money to some missionaries and spent them on our train tickets. But we had hundreds of books and Bibles and we had nothing that we could do. And I said, well, Kevin, I've missed God. I thought we were supposed to spend our last money to change our, airline, or our train tickets and come to the far west of China. And here we are. They can't take our Bibles, our contacts. They can't do any work with us. What are we going to do? I thought, oh, I need to pray more, pray more. And Kevin looked at me and he said, Leslie, we are going to go out and we are going to witness to the people because... When we see God helping people, we will remember just how much he wants to help us. And it was as we were out there witnessing on those streets that we met the young man that took us to his teacher that allowed us to give away the Bibles. And that man, when we gave him the Bibles, this is the short part of the story. Someday you'll hear the full story. When we gave him the Bibles... Actually, the story is in High Adventures for Christian Living. If you've never read that book, I encourage you to get a copy today. As we opened that Bible, I mean, we, as we gave them those Bibles, that man walked across the room and he dropped a bag of money into Kevin's lap. Are you hearing me? And that was his tithe for the entire year. Remember, practice soul winning as a habit, because as you do it, you will be reminded as you see God meeting the needs of other people that he will also meet your needs.
Now, to be an effective soul winner, you need to learn also to develop conversation openers. In other words, what, what phrases do you like to use? I could do a whole course just on this point, but suffice it today to say this. Tell people specifically why you are spending your valuable time talking to them. Conversation openers. Here I have something very special I want to share with you today about my life. And what maybe that's your opener. Or maybe your opener is, may I pray with you today? Or I would like to pray with you today because I was healed of cancer. Or my friend was healed of cancer. Or just have practiced routines of what you will share with those that you do not know because you can fall back into that routine. It becomes your confidence. Why do I have notes here? Why do I take time to refresh all of this every time I speak to you? Why do I study? Because I want to have the ready answer, the words that I need to speak. Develop conversational uh, uh, openers and then ask the people. As I had said earlier, I have a time limitation. Do you have time limitations like I do of five or ten minutes? Why do you say that? Because immediately you let them know you respect them and you respect their time. Then if you get at the end of five or ten minutes and you're not done, you just say, are we okay? Can I continue talking with you today? And many times they'll say, oh, yeah, let's go on. Let's continue speaking and talking. <coughs> also, remember to locate the person by saying this. Have you had spiritual questions sometime in your life? In America, just about everybody's had a spiritual question. <coughs> Number two, is there an area where you don't know all the answers in your life? Could God be in that area of your life? And then you can say, have you ever heard a one-minute summary of the gospel? And for those of you who've been following and working with us for many years, we know that one-minute summary. It's God's creation, Satan's deception, Jesus' substitution, and our restoration. And again, you can get a whole series of messages on that theme. But you might just find those words that help you best in the society that you are working in. If you're in an atheistic society, then you want to think about uh, they're going to they're gonna say, I don't believe there is a God. And then you might say to them, if I can prove to you that he's alive, they'll look at you like, huh? Have you ever had a need? Do you have a need? Do you need prayer for your physical body? You must be bold because God will heal them right on the spot. And sometimes they'll say, wait, what did you do to me? Is that magic? What did you do to me? And you'll say, no, sir. No, sir. Or, no, no. It's not magic. It's the reality that the Jesus who walked on the earth 2,000 years ago who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. The scripture says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is alive right now in here in our midst. Then some people will challenge you on the authority of Jesus, so be prepared. I often use other resources. For example, Gandhi said of Jesus, there is no better teacher in all of the earth. No better teacher. Did we lose things? I, Huh? Okay, we're okay. Sorry. No better teacher. So when I'm speaking in a, in a Hinduistic culture or in that particular environment, I'll say, do you know how Gandhi spoke of Jesus? Yes, I know. Jesus didn't call. Gandhi didn't receive Jesus or call him Savior or acknowledge him as the son of God. But he acknowledged him as the best teacher who ever walked on the earth. And that if the Christians had been more like Christ, he would have received this Jesus. So that's what Gandhi said. So you and I have a commission to be more like Jesus and to share that good news. So remember that in order to be a witness for Christ, you got to get up out of the couch, off the couch, away from the computer. Well, you can witness actually through the computer and the Internet in many different ways. But if you're sitting at home all by yourself watching television or you're spending most of your time alone in your garden, you have to put yourself, join a garden club. You have to put yourself in a position so that you can be that witness. The grocery store, gas station, local park, hair salons, malls, we're not waiting for people to come to church. We are going out among the people. If people wanted to come to church, all of the churches would be full. But folks, they're not. People want to experience the supernatural. 
Again, I understand that laws dictate certain activities in different nations, but people want to experience the supernatural. So as you go out into the streets or you go out into the highways and byways, the gifts of the Spirit will come into operation to help many needy people around you. Oh, my goodness. I am really just about out of time. So you're going to have to get my full course and all of my outlines. So let me, let me give you some witnessing toolkit ideas for your team. And I want you to know that we're going to make this available for you as a download. Keep these things in mind. Your witnessing toolkit for your team. As I've mentioned already, gather your approaches. Write them out and be prepared. As I said, I'm here with a special service to the community and helping people. Here's one example. We have prayer for the sick, and I'm sharing my experience that helped me. Two, I'm looking for a special type of person today, one with a physical pain or an injury. Three, I'm looking for a special type of person today, one with a spiritual question or hunger. Four, do you have five minutes? I'm looking for a special type of person today who has five minutes to speak with me. And five, as I mentioned earlier, I have that one minute presentation of the gospel I'd like to share with you today. Remember also in our soul winning toolkit, we must remember our attitudes. Always maintain a pleasant attitude. Do not allow people to engage you in a hostile argument. I was giving witness just the other day and someone started to get hostile. You know why? He was a homosexual. And he was with his boyfriend. And he looked at me and he says, well, they tell me, you know, God loves me and I can't get to heaven because I'm a homosexual. And I said, sir, that in fact is not true. I said, you don't not get to heaven because you're a homosexual. You don't get to heaven because the scripture tells us in John chapter 3, and Jesus tells us later that The Holy Spirit will be sent. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, I must go because when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. And will convict the world of what? Of not believing on me. That's the ultimate sin. The ultimate sin isn't how many things that are stacked up against me that I've done wrong. The ultimate sin that we will go to hell for, that we will fall short of the mark of Jesus Christ, is the sin of not believing on him. So remember, to maintain a pleasant attitude. I did not fight with that gentleman. I just clearly articulated with that, and I told him, I said, as God loves you, so do we love you. Come to him, and he'll let you know how much he loves you. Number two, remember this. Always speak with open hands and a heart and not with closed fists. As I have said over the years, what picture have you ever seen of Jesus with a closed fist? No, they're like this. And oh, I tell you what, revival meetings, Holy Ghost revival meetings often have the preacher up on the platform, throw it forth his fist, throw it out his hand, you must, you need to, you have to, you've got to. Jesus just simply says, come unto me, come unto me. When he went to the cross, his hands were nailed to that cross open. His hands were not nailed to the cross like this. His face was not like this. His hands were open. And so we bring them to the cross, the open arms of the cross. If you'll bear with me just a few more minutes, I'm about to finish. I recognize my clock says that it's just right at 12. Remember these attitudes. Be presentable. Many people fear strangers in today's world. Smile. Especially in the United States, there's so many people who have anger in their hearts. So you smile so people understand that you do not carry anger in your hearts. Speak in an understandable language. Do not use Christian club talk. Hey, if they're not born again, they're not willing to worship the Lord our God right now. So you don't, praise God, hallelujah, find Jesus. Always engage in conversation, stress the positive benefits of the gospel, and bring them to a point of decision. Be clear, you're not a bringing them. I ran into this last week. Uh, I've had enough of organized religion. I've had enough of the organized church. I don't want anything to do with it. And I said, sir, I am not speaking to you about organized religion. 
I am talking to you about the living God who loves you. And I stand beside you here today as you sit on this motorcycle because he sends me to tell you he loves you and whatever you found from organized religion, he wants you to know that he sent people here today to pray for you that you would find safety on your bike and that you would know that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. His face just melted as he looked at me and he went, Okay, and then he drove off on his motorcycle. Always make your exit pleasant when you speak to someone, even if they reject the gospel. And why is this important? Because we rejoice in the seed planted. We do not rejoice in only the conversion, but we rejoice in the seed planted because the life is in the seed. You will plant, and as Paul had told us, Apollos watered, and the harvest will be given by someone else. Remember to gather your practical materials. I've got several more pages, but we will make this available for you as a download. Carry your Bible, carry your track, carry your personal story. And I want you to see that we have wonderful tools. As we pass these out during Bike Week, they were received so well. It's supernatural. Have you seen him? New life. I like new life because it has some key words for us. Recognize, enter, pray. And it tells people how to find Christ. And then we have God's master plan. And these have been translated into other languages as well. So here are your soul winning tools. Not only that, this book called Pathway to Healing is a very small book on healing, full of testimonies and full of scripture. And people were taking these off the table. Uh, I had to restock these a couple of times because so many people were interested in this. Most people... Uh, many people face sickness and disease. So have your soul winning tools available when you go out. And then I have a, also have a new life book, not just the booklet that I share with people. All of these are available for you to purchase or some of these things are available. My soul witnessing toolkit, I will make available for you for a download. Or actually, a Kobe, is it easier for them to download or to send us their email address? What do you recommend? It's a PDF. Um, yeah, we'll send it as PDF, but they, uh, they also can uh, send a request. Okay, so we will email this to you as a PDF in our upcoming e blast. So if we don't have your email address, you're not going to get it. You need to write, you need to go ahead and go to tentnation.com and make sure you register because this will give you, <coughs> as I close, remember, you want to be aware of time wasters. Avoid those who are just trying to control your time and who are only wanting to argue. Just walk away. Avoid cults if you don't feel comfortable in, in talking because, you know, just avoid the cults. Start where you're comfortable. Miss Julie, who was a missionary in Russia, would travel, she and her husband, with Kevin and I on the trains. And, you know, she'd say to me, Leslie, I want to be like you. You're just amazing how you preach when you stand up on that platform and I see that people come to Christ and you're so anointed and full of the power of God. And I'm thinking, Julie, we got on the train. We're riding, I don't know, maybe from Moscow to northern St. Petersburg. And within just a few minutes, I hear... Julie's saying, hey, everybody. And I look out in the hallway of the train car, and there is Miss Julie. And because of her accent and her smile and her bright, happy face, she had the entire train car listening to her. Are you hearing me? Just be who God's planted you to be. She wanted to be the platform preacher that I was, but she had a smile she had a heart of love, and she had an accent and a way that would attract the people to come and hear about Jesus Christ. So allow God to use you the way he can. And whenever you go out and you take time to share the good news, come home and debrief. Take a journal time moment and write out the positive and negative things you've learned from your experience. If you do this as a group, for example, you may be a church listening today, and maybe you want to go down to the market on Saturdays, and you just, you're not going there to stand and shout at everybody, but you're going to look for people you'll be drawn to witness to. And maybe you want to pass out a Bible or a flyer from your church or an invitation, and you want to get outside of your four church walls. Well, when you get out there to do that, you know, just 
come back to the church together and debrief together. What did I learn? What can I improve? What tools will help me? You'll be amazed because the scripture says the person who wins, he or she who wins souls is what? Wise. So I trust that today you have gathered something from our time together. If you're listening to me today, I want to pray with you as I close and then our announcer, Akob, will come on to share some things with you. Here's what I want to say to you, wherever you are. Father, I'm praying for those who are listening to me right now. And I ask you, Jesus, you told us to wait till we be endued with power from on high. I ask you right now to baptize them in the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus, that they would be refreshed and renewed and strengthened and that they would have the opportunity, Father God, to experience the fire of your presence in the name of Jesus and that as they open up their mouths, just as happened on the day of Acts or the day of the, of, uh, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came upon the people, they all began to speak in foreign languages, in tongues. So, Lord, may that come upon your people even, even as they listen here today in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father God, that as they go forth, you empower them with life and with your ability to be motivated by your love because love comes first and power is a part of the resurrection that power gift of healing, that power gift of delivering, that power gift of taking authority over demonic activity in a person's life. We thank you, Father, that each one of us have that supernatural ability working in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I trust you got something out of that today. And I look forward to being with you again. I have so much more detailed information. I'm just going to have to get you again. There are more things. But I will give you my soul winning toolkit so that you'll have time to review it on your own. We love you. We thank you for your time today. Akob.